So I'm here today to draw upon my knowledge from studying rattlesnakes for almost 25 years and um, including 15 years as a professor at Cal Poly studying our local rattlesnakes here um, to tell you ways that you can be safe and not worried while you're in the wild. And that pretty much goes along with the mission of why I founded Central Coast Snake Services, which is um, my goals are really to promote safety of people first, of course, and their pets um, in areas where there's rattlesnakes. And then um, the secondary goal, which is a very important one to me too, is to reduce this conflict for the rattlesnake's sake. So as you're gonna hear from this talk, rattlesnakes are pretty amazing animals and they really wanna to keep to themselves. And most of what you may have heard about them on TV is a myth. It tends to be that dangerous animals, legitimately dangerous animals like a rattlesnake tend to get a bad rap on TV because they portray them as being far more vicious and crazy than they actually are. That said, rattlesnakes are really interesting, not in the way that you've seen on Animal Planet though, they have their own reasons why they're really interesting. So today we're gonna to be going over that and hopefully you'll leave with a new appreciation for rattlesnakes. I do want to note that um, a lot of what I'm talking about today, it's not just my business, Central Coast Snake Services, which is really a local Central Coast entity that does this, but there are much larger groups, um, including some that I've learned a lot from myself, including Advocates for Snake Preservation, shown here on the bottom. So if you really are interested in some of the information I'm talking about today, I do encourage you to go visit their website. Okay, so let's go ahead and get started. This is our local rattlesnake, the Southern Pacific rattlesnake. It's the only species of rattlesnakes that we have here on the Central Coast. And in fact, um, some people like to think that the Northern Pacific rattlesnake starts around the Santa Barbara Slow County line, but new research has really suggested that Southern Pacific rattlesnakes extend much further north. Bottom line is just one species of rattlesnake. They vary a lot in their coloration. They look sometimes like different animals, but they're all the same. Now I want you to take a mental image of this um, adult female. This is a pregnant adult female who's curled up with another female's babies. You can see one hiding at the bottom there too. And we're going to come back to that at the end and talk about why this unique behavior where a female is hanging out with babies may be something, one, one in, in many, um, in, in a long list of reasons to really appreciate rattlesnakes. Okay, so these are the myths that I'm going to bust for you today. And they're the top rattlesnake myths. Um, definitely, if you've heard other rattlesnake myths, feel free to ask me in the Q&A at the end. But I'm gonna go through these one by one, starting with a really um, mild one, the myth that they lay eggs. And I'll, I'll, bust, I'll bust that myth. And then we'll go on to a lot of the other myths, which as you might imagine, have to do with how rattlesnakes interact with people. And while I'm doing this, I will not only regale you with cool science facts, but I'm also going to make sure that I tell you about what when there are risks and what you should do about those. So we're not here to minimize the risk that rattlesnakes pose. An accident with a rattlesnake is a serious medical emergency. We're here to reduce the chance that such an accident could happen and to talk about what you should do if it does. Okay, so I'm gonna go through these one by one and we'll start with the myth that rattlesnakes lay eggs. So I remember when I was younger, someone gave me one of these little envelopes. I don't know if anyone, if any of you have ever seen these. But um, if I could see all your faces on Zoom, I bet a lot of you would be laughing and nodding because of course what happens, it says keep in a cool place to prevent hatching. You open it up and there's basically a rubber band spring wire in there. So it starts rattling when you open it as though the hatchling rattlesnakes are now gonna bite you. But of course, that's a silly, that's a silly prank, but rattlesnakes don't lay eggs at all. In fact, they're viviparous or they have live birth just like people do. And to illustrate their reproduction, because I wanted to start with that to tell you how fascinating they are, I'd like to just briefly discuss a year in the life of a Central Coast rattlesnake. Knowing about what they're doing, when they're doing it, and why they're doing it is also helpful for understanding what you might encounter when you're out hiking the trails in the Los Padres National Forest or other public areas as well. So we pick up here in spring, which is right about now, that's when the rattlesnakes are mating. You're most likely to see the bigger snakes, which are the males, out cruising around, maybe seeing them crossing roads in the spring because it's mating season. And he'll find a female if he's lucky and he'll sit with her sometimes for weeks, including months, hoping to get her to mate with him. If she does mate with him, or actually even if she doesn't mate with him, she'll become pregnant that year, possibly. And that's because females can store sperm from males for years even. The record that we know of is five years in a rattlesnake. So she doesn't even have to mate with a male that year to become pregnant. Um, she will basically gestate her babies, and I'm going to show you some pictures of that in a minute, but the babies inside her body. She'll gestate them for a few months, and then she'll give birth in the summer. So here's a female rattlesnake giving birth. I'll show you a video of that as well pretty soon. 
And that tends to occur in August. It can happen as early as July, but and as late as September, but usually it's August. And here on the Central Coast, they give birth to an average of about three to six babies, little live babies that come out in a little amniotic sac with a placenta and an umbilical cord. Again, just like a human baby. Um, but they can have, sometimes some females have more babies and some can have fewer. Then very interestingly, the females will all hang out together in some cases. And if you look really carefully at this picture, you'll see there's babies hanging around with them. I'm gonna get back to this at the end of the talk, but I wanted to note that rattlesnakes are one of the only reptiles that actually care for their young. They do it for a short period of time. They stay with their babies for about two weeks until the babies shed and go off into the world on their own. Um, meanwhile, what else is happening in summer is that the males and some of the other snakes are eating ground squirrels. This is gonna become important later on, knowing that where there are California ground squirrels, there are rattlesnakes and vice versa. These two go hand in hand. Then in autumn, we have a secondary mating season where the males find the females again and look to mate with them. We can see rattlesnakes mating here on the right-hand side. And then as it starts to get colder, they will retreat into ground squirrel burrows again, starting to see a pattern here. And they'll spend the winter either underground in a ground squirrel burrow, which is really common in milder, more coastal areas, or sometimes they'll go into these big rocky outcrops where they can get really deep down, especially when it's in a really, um, cold place where like more inland areas that get colder in the winter. So because this reproductive biology is so unique, I wanted to take the opportunity to show you a few photos so that you can see that they do indeed do not lay eggs. This is an ultrasound and I'm gonna show you, it's gonna be a video ultrasound of a pregnant rattlesnake that we took here um, from the veterinarian at Cal Poly. What you're looking at, each one of these is an internally kept egg and all of this white stuff is yolk. And then the, 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 this thing at the bottom that you're seeing is a rattlesnake fetus. So it's an early term fetus because as the pregnancy continues, it's gonna be pulling that yolk up through its umbilical cord and it will grow and the yolk will go away. Right here, we see the beating heart of the fetal rattlesnake, which is a pretty amazing thing to be able to see in an ultrasound. So once again, once it's sucked all that yolk up and it's grown to be a big um, baby rattlesnake, it's time to be born. And this is a video of a different species of rattlesnake giving birth. So again, you can see it kind of coming out inside its amniotic sac. Notice the mother rattlesnake is that going over there and actually checking out a previous baby that had just been born. She's looking at it. If you've ever watched, you know, um, dogs or cats give birth, it's the same thing. They're worrying about the ones that were just born as they are in the process of giving birth to the next ones. And so they're born inside their amniotic sac. And then in a few minutes, what they'll do is they will start poking around in there and they'll poke their little heads out of their amniotic sac and take their first breath because prior to this point, they're actually exchanging gas via their umbilical cord, which you can just see right there came off. So here is a different species of rattlesnake yet that was just about to come out of its amniotic sac. So it's writhing around in that sac. It's like, I need some air. And we can see some of the blood vessels in that sac. And then everybody watch this rattlesnake take its first breath. Okay. And so like I said, this, that then the next thing is that this female rattlesnake will um, stay with her babies. And so this is a, you can actually see that these, some of these babies are still inside their amniotic sac. So this female a Western diamondback rattlesnake from Arizona is actively guarding them and protecting them from predators. And like I said before, she'll do that for about two weeks. So rattlesnakes are good mothers. Okay, going on to the next myth, uh, the myth of I was chased by a 10 foot rattlesnake. So the first thing I wanna say is that rattlesnakes do not chase people. Um, I've never seen um, a video or other convincing evidence of a rattlesnake or any snake for that matter, chasing a person. Now, sometimes it can seem that way because they wanna get somewhere and you stand between them and the place they wanna be, they'll just go, but they're not chasing you. One of the themes of tonight's talk is that rattlesnakes do not wanna bite you. They want nothing to do with you. They're hoping you don't even notice them. But the second thing about this is there's no such thing as a 10 foot rattlesnake. People tend to overestimate the size of a rattlesnake, just like they can overestimate the size of sharks and other things that they think are really scary. I wanna warn you that the next images I'm gonna show you might be, um, might be disturbing to some people because it shows some dead rattlesnakes. So these are people all proudly displaying uh, rattlesnakes. And this is what gives rise to the myth that rattlesnakes can be 10 feet long. Now, if you were in my class at Cal Poly, I would ask you to tell me why it is that these snakes look so big, but because we're saving questions for the end, I'm gonna show you instead, and I'm gonna show you that it's the old, um, my snake is bigger. I want you to think my snake is bigger than it actually is trick that's done by force perspective. So this shows a uh, stuffed snake on the end of a hook. 
And if you just hold it out towards the camera, it makes it appear, appear really, really large. So don't fall for these tricks anymore. Here on the Central Coast, a big rattlesnake is a big male is about four feet long. And trust me, that's a big enough snake um, to be a formidable animal if it's defending itself. Um, out east, like in Florida, eastern diamondback rattlesnakes, historically, and maybe even now, um, can get up to about eight feet long. They don't tend to get to that size anymore for complex reasons. We tend to find them quite a bit smaller. But again, here on the Central Coast, two to three feet is much more common, occasionally as big as four feet. Okay, biggest myth of all is that rattlesnakes are laying in wait to, in nature to bite people. That's absolutely not true. Like I said before, they want nothing to do with you. Now, people have a fear of snakes and it's rooted in some really complex biology. We co-evolved with snakes and they could, you know, they could envenomate us. So potentially there's hypotheses out there that we are innately afraid of snakes. But even if that's, that's true, the vast majority of fear of snakes appears to be learned. It appears to be learned from adults. So when I go out and do outreach experiences with kids, I find that they are generally very, very interested in snakes and it's the adults and they watch the adults behavior saying, eek, ack, uck, gross. The kids basically pick up on that and try to emulate the adults. So the truth is that um, uh, we, our fear from snakes is really complicated, but it's not, tr it's not true that rattlesnakes are laying in wait to bite us. It comes from TV as well. So many of us have seen, or at least seen ads for these sensationalistic movies like Snakes on the Plane, or even these shows on Animal Planet and Discover Channel that really just blow things out of proportion. They do a lot of harassing of the animals to make the animals extremely defensive. And then they call that aggressive. But in reality, a rattlesnake cannot be aggressive to a person because it does not have any reason to bite you other than to defend itself. The truth is much, much less interesting. This is what rattlesnakes do. And the truth is that Animal Planet could not sell a show showing a little coiled up pancake that could be mistaken for a cow pie. That's what rattlesnakes do. This rattlesnake that I found in the Carrizo Plain in California is desperately hoping that I don't see him. He sees me, he knows I'm there, but he's hoping that he blends into the ground enough that I, as the threat, as the predator, won't come and catch him and eat him. And only once I go after him is he going to show any defensive behavior towards me. And I want to mention, by the way, that even then he might not. I've handled thousands of rattlesnakes in my life, and I would say that maybe about 10% of them ever even rattle at all. So even more myths that they rattle before they strike, that's not necessarily true, and so on. Rattlesnakes' venom is for one thing. They want to bite prey. When rattlesnakes are babies, they tend to eat lizards, like our blue belly lizards that you see all over the place in the Central Coast. And their venom tends to be um, optimized for eating things like these lizards. And I'll get back to that later on when I talk about the ultimate myth, which is the myth of the baby rattlesnake being more dangerous than the adults. And then as they grow, their venom changes composition, they get more venom, and they start to eat primarily rodents. Uh, ooh, I forgot I had a slide in here though. They do eat birds sometimes. And here's a fun fact for you. This snake has captured this bird. Normally rattlesnakes will strike and release their prey item and then they'll hunt it down by a scent later on. Well, when they, when they hunt a bird, they don't strike and release, they hold on to it, which makes sense because if the bird flew away, it couldn't leave that scent trail on the ground, the snake could follow. Rodents like ground squirrels are the rattlesnake's main meals. California ground squirrels are a huge part of the diet of rattlesnakes. They have a very, very complex relationship because in fact, ground squirrels can be resistant to the venoms of local rattlesnakes. It doesn't mean though that they're immune to it entirely. As we can see with evidence here, sometimes the ground squirrel loses, sometimes it wins. But especially the baby ground squirrels get eaten by rattlesnakes a lot. So not only is the ground squirrel a major prey item for rattlesnakes, but rattlesnakes like to live in their houses. And so they have this really, really tight relationship, which is why the first thing I tell people who say, I don't want rattlesnakes in my yard, I live in a rural area, is you need to humanely manage for ground squirrels in the area, not by poison, not by any of that stuff, but by trying to get rid of the ground squirrel burrows around your house, because that will attract rattlesnakes. But of course, rattlesnakes are eaten by other things too. It's not like they're a top predator. They're what we call a meso predator because they eat stuff and they get eaten by stuff. Badgers, which are, pretty amazing animals, um, eat rattlesnakes a lot. This is a great photo because you look at it and you see, that looks like a rattlesnake in distress, but if you look really carefully in the center, you can see something's going on there. That's a California king snake, the coils of a king snake. 
constricting this pregnant female rattlesnake to death. And indeed, this pregnant female rattlesnake was killed by this king snake, who, by the way, are immune to rattlesnake venoms. And this king snake managed to eat that rattlesnake, which was the same size as the king snake, all in one, all in one bite. Imagine if it was, if you're a 150 pound person, it's like you eating a 150 pound burger without taking any bites, without using any hands, eating it all at once. It's pretty amazing what king snakes can do as well. And then of course, birds of prey are huge sources of pred predation on rattlesnakes. Many birds of prey are not resistant to rattlesnake venoms or we don't know for sure if they are or not. We think they're not because they will actually rip off the business end, which is the head of the rattlesnake before carrying it off to their cute little babies for a nice big sausage for that baby to eat. All of this is to tell you that rattlesnakes form an incredibly important part of our local Central Coast food web. Here's a very, very simplified version of a food web where we see things like these top carnivores, things like um, uh, mountain lions, coyotes, bobcats, all eat rattlesnakes. Birds of prey eat rattlesnakes. And then all three of these predators eat these rodents and all the other types of rodents that are not shown on here. California ground squirrels, which by the way, are one of the hugest pests in California. They might look cute, but they cost the state of California hundreds of millions of dollars of year, every year in damage to infrastructure from burrowing under buildings, burrowing into dams, um, from actually eating livestock feed. Most of like, I heard from the people at Cal Poly that um, in one of the livestock granaries, the ground squirrels cleaned it out. They ate all the feed. So it's a big problem, right? These ground squirrels. And so rattlesnakes definitely help keep them under control as well as many other rodents, which again, these rodents, there's nothing wrong with rodents, but it's all about nature's balance. If rodent populations skyrocket out of control because we mess with their predators, then the rodents are gonna overeat plants and we get the denuding of vegetation down to nubs. And again, nature out of balance. So rattlesnakes are an important part, just like many other snakes of our local food webs. Okay, now I'm gonna talk about rattlesnake bites. So I'm gonna talk about when a bite does happen and I'm also gonna talk about how to prevent it. So the first thing I wanted to say is that rattlesnake bites are extremely rare. They don't happen very often. When they do, it's very rare for someone to die from them. And that's because of modern medicine. So I'm gonna give you some statistics now on snake bite and prevention. So the first thing is that there's about 8,000 bites from venomous snakes per year in the United States. Most of these bites are from rattlesnakes or from their relatives, which are snakes like copperheads and cottonmouths or water moccasins, which occur out east. Those don't occur in California. And of those 8,000 venomous snake bites, there's only about five deaths. This is primarily because of the fact that we have really good anti-venoms that can treat these. And I'll talk more about that in just a minute. Furthermore, about 15% of these defensive bites that rattlesnakes make are what we call dry bites, meaning that the snake was bluffing, was scared of you, and was trying to get you to leave it alone, and did not inject any venom. Um, if someone is unlucky enough to be bitten by a rattlesnake, but it's a dry bite, they would be extremely lucky because that wouldn't require the medical treatment. So these envenomations are treated with antivenin, and like I said, it's highly effective. There's two different kinds. One of the one of them, the second second kind was actually just approved recently for use throughout the United States. And the problem though with it is that it's extremely extremely pricey. So I'm going to use as an example here of a young Boy Scout who was bitten in Lake Kachuma back in 2015. This is misleading because this bill you see here for $150,000 that was for the antivenom alone for his bite. His medical bill was $600,000. I mean, that's just insane, right? Luckily, this young man's um, insurance paid for it. But the point is that the antivenom is, the prices of it are so high that if anyone is bitten and they are either uninsured or underinsured, then it can be financially ruinous, even if it does save their life and potentially save them from having any damage to the tissue site. So snake bite is a serious medical emergency and preventing it is by far the best thing we can all do. So I want to talk about prevention because I know that's why a lot of you are here. And it's a lot simpler than you think. Preventing rattlesnake bites comes down to this. When you're enjoying our natural lands, there's a reason to stay on the trail. And rattlesnakes are one of the big reasons. There's a few other reasons, things like poison oak and ticks and so on. And of course, making sure that we are not trampling on um, delicate soils and vegetation. But staying on trails is another way to help avoid being bitten by a rattlesnake. Rattlesnakes don't really like to be out in the open as often. If you see them on a trail, you're most likely going to be seeing them crawling across the trail. 
Rattlesnakes on the central coast like to curl up in places like the tall grass or underneath at the base of an oak tree or in rock in a rocky outcrop. Very important to keep dogs on leash. Now I'm a dog owner and I used to let my dogs run around all the time. I don't anymore ever since I really started studying how many rattlesnakes, I started studying rattlesnakes and seeing what they do and where they are. But that goes both ways because not only am I worried about my dog being bitten by a rattlesnake, but in places on the central coast where dogs are supposed to be on leash, we see healthy populations of rattlesnakes as well because the dogs can't disturb them. So it really does help to maintain that balance. Very important to keep your dog on a leash. Plus I just picked a bunch of ticks off of my dog. It also helps to keep ticks off of your dog too. Before I forget to mention it, I wanted to mention to everyone here that I do have resources on my website, uh, centralcoastsnakeservices.com under the links tab on how to keep your dog safe from snake bite with more details. So feel free to visit that as well. Very importantly, do not put your hands and feet where you cannot see them. The majority of snake bites are what we call illegitimate bites, which means someone's messing with the snake. I'm gonna mention that in a minute. But of the, of the bites that are legitimate bites, meaning someone had an accident, it's very commonly going to be someone stepping on the snake, like if you stepped over a fallen log or a rock, or somebody who was, um, you know, gardening or otherwise handling plants in an area and didn't really look underneath that plant. So I always tell people that if they're out in the wild, making a ruckus stomping around is a good thing because you're more likely to have the rattlesnake warn you that it's there. It's not guaranteed, but it's more likely that it'll warn you that it's there. And in general, being aware of your surroundings looking where you, before you sit down somewhere, all these sorts of things will help you avoid those accidents that can happen. If you do encounter a snake, say on a trail, don't run because we don't want you to run away and trip and fall and hurt yourself. If you, if you find yourself like stepping up towards one and you're very close to it, definitely back away and stop about 10 feet away, take your breath, and then watch it again, because once you've calmed down from the initial shock of seeing one or just surprise, even if you like rattlesnakes, sometimes they can surprise you. It's a really cool thing to be able to see rattlesnakes in the wild. So I definitely recommend that you stop, look at it from a safe distance, maybe take some photos and observe it because what a wonderful thing we have here on the central coast to be able to observe wildlife, including rattlesnakes. Then you need to walk around it. So you wanna give them about a 10 feet, 10 foot burr People always ask things like, how far can rattlesnakes strike? It's unpredictable. I don't like to give an answer to that. It depends on the size of the snake and its temperature and so on. But if you stay 10 feet away from them, you're gonna be fine. If it's blocking the trail, you can do things like take a really long um, uh, stick and kind of nudge it. You can do things like throw some dirt at its tail. Please don't throw rocks at it because it could hurt it and make it mad. But usually if you do that sort of thing, it's gonna crawl along and go on its way. Um, so that would only be the case to do that if you can't just walk around it on the trail. Okay, and so that's all fine when we're out in public lands, but if it's in your, if it's in your backyard, if your home is in what we call snake country, which is a snaky area, like up against um, open spaces and you get snakes in your yard, it's a lot trickier. And I'm not gonna spend much time about talking about this today because we're talking about, you know, what to do if you're out enjoying our public lands. But if your snake, if your home is in snake country, then you can do things to make your yard less um, hospitable to snakes. You can block hiding spots like areas underneath sheds and stuff. You can manage rodents, like I said before, remove dense bushes. And again, I have another article on my website that lists off, um, that discusses ways that you can make your yard less hospitable to rattlesnakes. Definitely avoid bird feeders and water sources. So the snakes want three things. They want to eat, so rodents and birds, they want water, and then they want that low shade. They wanna be able to get in, up and under things. Um, there, you can also do rattlesnake proof fencing in your house, but that's only appropriate for certain people. And I, I'm not gonna talk about that further today. Okay, so more on snake bite. If you're bitten, you should cut and the wound and suck out the venom. That's a big myth. Or you can insert other treatment here. I've seen um, snake bite kits that try to suck the venom out. I've seen people put tourniquets on, I've seen people, heat on, put ice on. I've even heard stories of people trying to electrocute the site. Don't do any of those things. None of those work. And in fact, they're all going to make the problem worse. If someone is bitten, there's, it makes it actually really easy. Don't do anything, right? All you should do is stay calm, take off anything like any rings or anything like that that may be affecting the area. You do wanna elevate the limb. There's always misinformation out there. You definitely wanna elevate the limb and then get to the emergency room. Don't drive yourself, either call 911 or, um, or have a friend drive you if you can get there really fast. 
Don't do any of these other things that are listed on the right-hand side. And in fact, I can boil it down to this. In the event of a bite, go to the hospital immediately. The only way to treat a rattlesnake bite is with the antivenom, okay? Um, I do wanna note, however, though, that hospitals definitely differ in terms of how, um, how much their emergency room physicians know about how to treat a snake bite, both in terms of first aid and in terms of long-term treatment. And so I highly recommend that if anyone is bitten by a rattlesnake or much more likely, there's, more, there's about 30,000 dog um, envenomations per year in the United States. So if you know someone who gets bitten, it's more likely to be a dog. And you can also post about um, dogs and livestock to this site. It's this National Snake, snake Bite Support and they will immediately connect you with an actual snake bite physician or snake bite veterinarian expert that will, they'll, for free, they'll do things like read your animal's labs. They'll, they'll um, look at your, your you know, uh, your loved one's um, hospital results. They'll look at photos and they'll make sure that everything's going smoothly because it's so difficult to get a specialist in any old hospital. It's really important to have this resource online. You can join that group, by the way, and then just lurk in the background and not say anything, which is what they'll tell you to do anyway. And then that way you can post whenever, if, some, if something was to happen. Okay, so this is the myth that people say to me the most often, which is that bait, bites from baby rattlesnakes are more severe than bites from adults. They absolutely are not in any way, shape or form. I like to say that some myths are grounded in a little seed of truth, but are mostly false. The only thing that might be true about this one is if you remember back when I was talking about the baby rattlesnakes, how they like to eat lizards. Well, it could be possible that drop per drop, their venom might be a little more toxic than in adults because they have to take down a lizard, which is just as a different physiology than a rodent. However, none of that matters. It all gets washed out by the fact that adults are going to inject way more venom than a baby. You may have also heard that babies can't control the amount of venom that they inject. That's not true either. None of it's true. In fact, bites from larger snakes are, are more severe. So this figure right here um, from Dr. Bill Hayes out of Loma Linda University shows you a couple things. First of all, patient, weight essentially we're looking at here and then there's snake bite severity score so the higher the score the more severe the snake bite is so the first thing i want you to notice is that the heavier a person is the lower the snake bite severity score which makes sense there's a dilution effect right smaller people are going to have less blood for this um, venom to be diluted in but then i want you to notice these different colors these lines the top line is the snake size and it shows you that for any given person who's bitten so let's say a person is 60 kilograms being bitten by a large snake is much more severe than being bitten by a medium or by a small snake. So for sure, larger bites are more severe. And the reason it's really important to bust this myth is because it turns out that this myth is even believed by healthcare professionals who may be treating snake bites. So there was a study that was done also by Dr. Hayes that showed that the majority, in fact, 72% of Southern California health professionals believed that baby rattlesnakes were more dangerous and then they heard they couldn't control the venom. So now none of you will believe this anymore and you will pass this on to everyone else and we're gonna help bust that myth at large, okay? Rattlesnake bites are all very, very, very severe. Even a bite from a baby is a medical emergency. Someone should go to the hospital, but bites from adults are worse. Okay, and here's my last myth as I start to move into the end of the talk where I can open it up for questions and answers. And this one really is, um, hits home for me because I really appreciate rattlesnakes. I've gotten to spend countless hours in the wild watching what they do, seeing how they react when I come at them to be able to fully know, not just be told, but to fully know what these animals are like in the wild. And I wanna share some of that with you. As we all know, the vast majority of people on the planet either fear snakes and or hate snakes. People like me who really love snakes are, very, are relatively rare. And I'm here to you, I'm here today for you first and foremost, to make sure that you're safe out there in the wild. Many of you won't ever love a rattlesnake, but maybe you could at least respect it and not believe that the world would be better off without them. So a lot of people we find go out and kill rattlesnakes, believing that they're actually improving the situation, believing that this is gonna make people more safe. So we saw this with what happened in Ventura recently when what actually spurred this whole um, evening we're having together tonight, which is this year, a young man was um, killed a rattlesnake in public lands, in the rattlesnake's home. This also happened up in Pismo Beach last year on my local preserve where an out of town visitor stabbed a pregnant female rattlesnake to death on the preserve in her home. Now I'm here to tell you that it's actually never a good idea to kill a rattlesnake, not even in your own backyard. 
So here's a, you know, there's, there's, there's dozens and dozens of these news articles. This Texas man decapitated a rattlesnake. It bit him anyway, and he nearly died, his wife says. Well, that's the headline. I'm going to go ahead and correct that and say it bit him trying to defend itself, and he nearly died. It bit him anyway, right? The rattlesnake was not going to bite him unless he went after it. This is the case. Rattlesnakes are only trying to defend themselves. And indeed, rattlesnake heads that have been severed from the body can still bite for many minutes, even sometimes hours afterwards. So the best way to get bitten by a rattlesnake is to try to kill one. That's why it's never a good idea to kill a rattlesnake. It also gives you, a, let's say there's a rattlesnake in your yard and you kill it. It gives you a false sense of security that you've solved the problem. You haven't solved the problem. There's a bunch of other rattlesnakes around that you just don't see, and there's gonna be another one behind it. Instead, we need to learn how to live peacefully around snakes, reduce the risk of them being in your yard if you have dogs and kids, maybe even learn to appreciate when you do see one from afar in peace. So I've already told you that they're important parts of our local food webs. This is kind of the ecosystem services approach where we talk about the rattlesnakes playing a really vital role in controlling rodent populations. But it goes beyond just this food web. It turns out that rodents, as cute as they are, carry a lot of diseases. And I could name at least three here on the Central Coast that are carried by, rattles, by um, ground squirrels and deer mice and other types of rodents. So the first one I wanna talk about is um, uh, Lyme disease, which is not as common here on the Central Coast as it is out in the East Coast, but it definitely is here. So studies have shown that rattlesnakes out East actually reduce the incidence of Lyme disease. And the way that they do this is by eating ticks. Now, of course, they're not walking around eating or crawling around eating ticks. They're eating ticks secondarily by ingesting many rodents that have ticks all over them. Long story short, ticks life cycles has three stages. And the two juvenile life stages before they molt into an adult oftentimes feed on rodents and other small uh, wildlife. And so these study here estimated that um, one single rattlesnake can eat thousands of ticks in a single year if it's eating prey that's infested with ticks. So they therefore could be controlling Lyme disease. Now, of course, on the central coast, we have um, hantavirus that can be carried by deer mice. And then very importantly, we have plague, which is carried by ground squirrels. And it is endemic here. That's right, if you didn't know that. Indeed, our ground squirrels do have plague and rattlesnakes probably play a really important role in the ecology of all these diseases. Um, this is not a rattlesnake, but it's a close rattlesnake relative. And I wanted to mention it because a very important cardiovascular drug called captopril is, is literally made from the venom of this jararaca snake, which is from South America. Um, it is used in people who are preparing to undergo surgery to get a specific kind of stent put in in their heart. And what it does is this drug harnesses the power of a natural chemical. In the case of the venom, the venom, the purpose of this chemical in the venom is to block the, block the clotting in the prey that it's eating to help kill the prey. And that's what most of these viper venoms do is they interfere with the clotting. Well, in the case of a carefully controlled drug, it can prevent clots from forming on the stent that's put in to this patient. And so it's a really important life-saving drug. Rattlesnake venom is currently being studied using machine learning artificial intelligence techniques that are promising to just revolutionize the field of drug discovery. And there are many, many, many proteins in this complex cocktail of venoms that may be used to save many, many people's lives later on. Yet another reason to appreciate rattlesnakes. So, so far I've been really talking about um, things that, that, what are they good for? What do they do for us? But I wanna circle back now to this picture of this rattlesnake that I took at the Pismo Preserve. Like you just heard, the Pismo Preserve was a place where there was an uproar over a pregnant female rattlesnake um, back in July of last year, being killed in her own little birthing den. Well, I want to talk about the fact that rattlesnakes don't need to have a reason to exist. They deserve to exist out there just like any of us do, especially in their own, in their own land, in their own place where, like this preserve, they lived for hundreds, thousands of years before we came in there and built trails around them and then expect them to not be there anymore. No, they're there and they're always going to be there, okay? Um, and I think that um, we can look at this animal and go back to what I was talking about with her at the very beginning. This is a pregnant female rattlesnake. We can see how, how big her rear end is, so to speak. 
she's full of babies and she's sitting out there. And in fact, she's babysitting those baby rattlesnakes that were born to another female. That other female may be her sister. It seems like we know from some other studies that um, adult pregnant female rattlesnakes sometimes get together with their sisters or their close relatives to give birth together. What kinds of social behaviors are going on? What are, we, what are we learning? I'll tell you what we're learning. These animals are very, very complicated. Up until just maybe 15 years ago, we just thought that they were just like any other snake. And now we're starting to learn, well, I, you know what, I shouldn't say that. Now we're learning that many other types of snakes are also complicated too. These animals who it's difficult for us to study them before now, we're now able to see that they, they have friends. They, ha they hang out preferentially with certain individuals. They have family members, they take care of their young. These animals are, fascinating. They want to keep to themselves. And it's not up to us to decide that we get to kill them in their own home. Um, this photo is taken by Wyatt Stapp, who is a young man who showed me that rookery that we found at the Pismo Preserve. And I wanted to give a shout out to him because it's kind of a weird goes around comes what, what goes around comes around situation. Because if it wasn't for that snake getting killed at the Pismo Preserve, then I wouldn't have met Wyatt at our snake day event that the Land Conservancy of Slow County organized. And then Wyatt wouldn't have known to call me when he found this rookery of a bunch of pregnant female snakes, or in this case, now we see their babies all hanging out here together. And, um, and then furthermore, we wouldn't have had this connection where now I'm giving a talk to you all to learn about rattlesnakes. So I like to think that out of every bad interaction with a person, we have an opportunity for education to come in and do the thing that it's so good at, which is teaching people to not be afraid with knowledge and education comes power, comes safety. I spend a lot of my time doing rattlesnake awareness trainings in person. As you can see, most of these have masks on. These are, look, these down here in the bottom left, these are a Girl Scout troop that came to my house to learn about rattlesnakes. We made it happen even during the pandemic, folks. So um, it's very, very important that we um, promote education of these animals. And that's why I'm here today. And that's why I'm excited to answer your questions coming up. So I wanna thank, the Los Padres Forest Association for taking the time to protect what I call tricky wildlife. Um, the truth is that rattlesnakes are dangerous, just like um, mountain lions and wolves and so on, but they don't have to be if we're educated. Uh, speaking of wolves, I just had to mention this if you didn't see, today a gray wolf who has a radio collar from Oregon just crossed into San Luis Obispo County. I'm dying of excitement and this article here says that if he keeps going, he's going to enter the Los Padres National Forest very soon. So um, we live in a world where people have increasing encounters with wildlife, including tricky wildlife. And like I said before, knowledge and education is power. And hopefully we can all live peacefully together. Um, I want to thank you for coming and encourage you all to follow me on my three different social media sites. We're on Instagram, Facebook, and Twitter. The top one is for my local San Luis Obispo and Northern Santa Barbara um, snake consulting service. We also do free snake ID on that service. So you can always just tag at Coast Snake or text me a photo of a snake and I'll tell you what it is. Uh, in the middle is my academic website. That's my, um, this is where you can learn about the research I do at Cal Poly, including reading copies of our papers. And then this is my personal Twitter account. And then at the very bottom, a quick plug for a brand new project I have going on called Project Rattlecam which hasn't even officially launched publicly. We're still finishing it up, but it's a community science project where people like you can get involved with helping us analyze photos that we took outside a rattlesnake rookery in Colorado, and hopefully soon uh, doing the same thing with monitoring some live cams that we're gonna set up outside um, aggregated rattlesnake rookeries too. So with that, I would like to uh, say thank you once again and open it up for any questions that came up in the chat. Uh, Kendra can mod moderate those or uh, to people who wanna ask questions in person. So thank you. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. That was amazing. I learned so much and I'm sure um, lots of folks did too. So thank you so much for being here. Um, I'm going to go, there were actually a couple of questions about what to do if you were out on the trail and you do happen to get bit, um, like if you're far from the trailhead, what's the best, um, course of action there? Yeah. Um, that's a, qu that question does not have a good answer, unfortunately, because it's one of those questions where everyone wants you to be like, well, here's what you do. But the bottom line is that that is spells trouble. 
So first things first is if you're in a place where there's cell phone, you call for help and you call to have someone come and take you out of there. Um, the problems that really arise, which are pretty rare, is if someone is like on a backpacking trip way out in the middle of nowhere, miles from help. And I would hope that in general, people who do that are going to be carrying a satellite phone or are going to have an emergency plan. Because if you don't, the, frankly, there's, you're in trouble. There's no time. There's no like, oh, you need to get to a hospital within two hours. There's, that's a myth as well. There's complicated. It, it depends on the person's health. It depends on how they're reacting to the venom, how much venom, what kind of snake it was, everything. Even individuals of the same species have different venoms. So the bottom line is to try to remain as calm as possible. Um, if it happened to me, I would, and I couldn't get help on the phone, I would walk out and try to get help as soon as possible. If there's anyone that you can send for help to run ahead of you, that's the best possible thing. Because the problem with rattlesnake venom is that it's, it's having its impact primarily on the place that was envenomated. So let's say you stepped on a rattlesnake, it's potentially eating, the venom is potentially eating away at the tissues in your foot. So the longer it goes on, you're not necessarily likely to you know, die right away, but the longer it goes on, the more damage there could be done. So it is really important to get to help as quickly as you possible can. Now, I know that wasn't a very satisfying answer, but this is one of those situations where there's not a satisfying solution, except for carry a satellite phone if you're gonna be on a long backpacking trip in the middle of nowhere. And then you can get a medevac helicopter in that case. That is a great answer. Um not a situation we hope to get in. Yeah. Um, one question was, is it true that snakes can't hear except for vibrations? That is true. Snakes don't have um, real ears. Um, they, so they can't hear airborne sounds like we do, but what they, if you, long story short is that the snake's jaw bones, part of the snake's jaw bones um, are analogous to the bones that are in our ears. So when they have their jaw on the ground, they can sense vibrations in a similar sort of way going to their brain that they might hear something. So they're, sent, they're feeling you approach. Like if you walk up to a snake, they're feeling your footsteps on the ground. They also have pretty good vision. And then finally, they can basically smell and taste the air using um, their forked tongue. So um, the hearing is the sense that they don't have, but they have pretty good senses of everything else. Great, thank you. Um, Leah asked, are rattlesnakes as likely to be in woodlands as in tall grasses or open sunny areas? Yes, they are. Uh, Southern Pacific rattlesnakes are habitat generalists, so they can be anywhere around here on the central coast. Um, they're, I, my experience has been that they are less likely in both the eucalyptus forest, which seems like everything's less likely in there, um, and then really dense, thick forest where there's not a lot of sunlight you don't see them as like as commonly, but that can vary from spot to spot. Like there's some places in the forest where you might see a ton of them, especially next to a clearing. So I will just leave it at that by saying that these rattlesnakes are pretty much ubiquitous um, in the central coast. They go from literally right on the beach. So I, I've seen them in the surf, like in, like in the tide pools. They're right there on the beach, all the way across the central valley. And then they stop kind of on the slope of the Sierra going down into the desert where they are taken over by different species of rattlesnakes. So they're everywhere. Awesome. Maggie asked, what type of rattlesnakes populate the Northern Sierra Nevada um, living in Quincy area? Yeah, that would be a Northern Pacific rattlesnake, which is really closely related to Southern Pacific rattlesnakes. I believe, I believe Quincy is, I'm not, I don't have a map up, but I believe Quincy is on the it's on the west side of the Sierra, is that correct? It's not on the east side, it's not in the... Um... Yes, that's on yeah, the... Okay. Because what uh, happens is at the Sierra Nevada in the northern part of the range, on the east side, you start to get a transition into what's called a Great Basin rattlesnake. But the Northern Pacific rattlesnake is basically running from British Columbia down to about the Bay Area, all from the, from the coast to the Sierra Nevada, about. Great. And that's the only kind of rattlesnake that's up there at all in the Pacific Northwest, just that one kind. Hmm. Uh, Brian asked, what's the reason why there's different colorations between uh, some snakes? Some are black, some are brown. Is that related to shedding and sun bleaching? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, sun bleaching, no. Uh, they do change color when they shed. They get a little bit dull. And then when they shed, they're much more, much brighter colors. 
Um, aside from that, there's a lot of things. So first of all, they change colors as they grow. Baby rattlesnakes tend to have a light background with really dark blotches. And then as they grow up, they become a little bit more uniform, although they don't always. Um, you tend to see, if you see a really dark black rattlesnake, those tend to be more common in the big ones. And then aside from that, you just see this huge variation. And we don't know as scientists why. We definitely have studied it in my lab. We found that um, the, we, we did this at Sedgwick, by the way. We did a project at Sedgwick where we made snake models of different colors. And we found that predators um, got the black ones way more often. So the black ones that stood out against that California golden dead grass, those are the ones that the birds came in and hit and the wild pigs came in and tried to eat the models because they were fooled, they thought they were real snakes. The ones that blended in, they didn't eat as much. So you might be like, well, why are they black then? And so we still don't know, maybe it's a trade-off where they can um, heat up more readily when they're black. So the, there's a really wonderful question and we don't know the answer entirely. I will definitely tell you that in, in general, in terms of rattlesnake coloration, a lot of it is for camouflage. Um, some other species of rattlesnakes that live in rocks, they, their color matches the rocks, not because like a chameleon where they can change the color, but because through natural selection, the ones that blend in the most are the ones that survive and pass on their genes. So in things like the speckled rattlesnake, if anyone's interested, you should Google them. They just match the color of the rock. They're pink, they're white, they're black, they're blue, just all kinds of colors. It's absolutely fascinating. Thank you. Um, I want to go back to the, uh, the, the moment when you talked about why they wouldn't be in eucalyptus forests and explain that briefly. We've got a lot of great questions here. I don't really know. I'm not a plant biologist. I heard a rumor a long time ago that eucalyptus, um, and I say rumor because I think it's been overturned. Maybe someone in the audience might know. Um, I heard that, that eucalyptus can secrete chemicals into the soil around them that kind of prevents a lot of other plants from growing. And I've noticed that when I do surveys in eucalyptus groves, I see much less wildlife than I would see around it. But I also believe that what I just told you about the toxins might not be true. There was a student at Cal Poly who studied that. Maybe she overturned it. Um, so I don't know. I just feel like, you know, eucalyptus trees are not native to here. They, they're, they're all planted and they seem to me to not have a bunch, there's not a lot of wildlife there. I'm not an expert on why that is, but that's the place that popped to mind when I thought of a place in California where you don't see rattlesnakes. Um, aside from really highly developed areas and big farms, that's the only thing I could really think of off the top of my head. Awesome, thank you. By the way, don't assume that there's not gonna be a rattlesnake in eucalyptus, it still could happen. I'm just saying that it's not as likely. <laughs> gotcha. Um, Peter asked, what is a rattlesnake's range from its den? And if relocated, will it return to its den as far as its range goes? Yeah, that's a really good question. Um, and that's something we deal with a lot in my business, Central Coast Snake Services, because we do relocations of, of rattlesnakes from people's yards in San Luis Obispo and Northern Santa Barbara counties. Um, so first of all, kind of two parts to that question. One was the den and its range. So the den usually refers to kind of where it spends its winter, which may or may not be with a bunch of other snakes. So most rattlesnakes in the Central Coast just spend their winters alone in inside ground squirrel burrows and they wake up and they might travel a slight distance so they don't have those long distance movements like you see snakes in the midwest having for example um, anywhere where it's really cold out in the winter like the snakes i study in colorado they they are all going to be in the same spot because it's thermally the most important the most appropriate spot for them all to be and then they'll sometimes come out and travel miles even to get to their summer range on the Central Coast, you don't see that very often. You see that the, it's pretty mild. They're going to overwinter right in the middle of their home range. So their home range is maybe a few football fields big is all. And so when you move them, if a snake gets relocated, it's super important to relocate them not super far. If you relocate them really far, then the snake is disoriented. It's going to cruise around and it's going to get picked off by a predator or hit by a car. Um, what we do and what the gold standard is for all wildlife um, relocate all rattlesnake relocators is to relocate the snake about a quarter mile to a half mile away. That means that the snake is probably and still in familiar territory, but we have not experienced any snakes moving back to where they were before. In fact, I did a study on this with graduate students to figure out if the snakes would move back. The only times the rattlesnakes move back when we move them short distances is if we moved a male away from female in the spring. So he's like, hey, I'm gonna go back to my girlfriend. And he went right back. But other than that, they seem to either not come back or they seem to just not be noticed when they do come back. Now, I do wanna point out there's a lot of research out there that suggests that 
snakes that are transported only a short distance do come back. What I'm saying is that in my experience with Southern Pacific rattlesnakes, we don't ever see them coming back. They might come back, they might not. You have to really, as a, uh, and that's why people who do this like me are licensed by the California Department of Fish and Wildlife because we can make that judgment call on any given house about how far we should take the snake away to minimize the risk of it coming back, but also maximize its likelihood of doing well. And that's why we don't have someone who's just like dropping them off 25 miles away, which may be a death sentence for those snakes. Thank you. Um, Dan asked if you're seeing impacts from uh, rodenticides in snake populations on the central coast. So I don't have any data for that. It's a wonderful question. There's just not really a way for me to, to get those data. Um, I can tell you though, that if um, many places where I go to do property inspections, they have those little black um, bait stations and we find snakes curled up in those sometimes. My colleagues in Arizona find snakes curled up in those a lot. And you have to hope when you find that, that the snake hasn't eaten a rodent that has been envenomated, uh, excuse me, a rodent that has, um, has eaten the poison because the snake will die from eating the poison just like an owl will die from eating a poisoned um, you know, gopher or something like that. So that's why we never advise using poison to control ground squirrels. There's other ways to deal with it. I'm not, I'm not a ground squirrel trapping expert, but I know that there's trap and release programs. There's other ways that they can be managed. Um, it's pretty complicated, but um, so I don't have an answer to that, but yes, of course they're eating poisoned rodents and they will die from it. Their physiology will allow them to die from from those um, poisons, just as just as though they were a bird. Don't use poisons, please. Great. Um, how effective are snake gators? Okay, so another good question there. So um, people like me and my students who work in the tall grass all the time are I require that people wear snake gators, um, but I want to, and so they are very effective. There are many different models of them, and I want to put a big warning out there, which is if you Google snake gators and you shop for them, for some reason, regular gators show up in the search alongside snake gators. So for those of you who don't know, these are things that can basically cover your calves um, and go over the top of your shoe. So it create, creates this kind of impenetrable snake proof area up to your knee, which is where most bites would happen if you were to step in the tall grass. And um, the ones that are that are tested against snakes, the with thick ones are either thick leather or they're like a they have these inserts, these kind of cardboard inserts. Those ones are all very highly effective, but don't accidentally get some of the inexpensive ones, which are just there to keep pricklies out of your sock and are not snake gators, but they somehow show up in the search. I don't know why. <laughs> it's really weird. Um, on that note, footwear is important too. Some people I see walking around wearing snake gators, but then their hiking boots are the thin, breathable fabric with those mesh panels, well, a snake fan can go right through that. So someone who's actually really working in the in snake country, who's working out in, in the tall grass a lot, should have full leather um, shoes that are gonna be fully protective. Finally, they do make snake boots that come up to your knees that are, and that's what I have, that are fully tested and tried all the way through. I wanna point out that if you're just out there hiking on a trail, you don't need these things. You just need awareness. You need to watch where you're going and so on. All of those protective gear are primarily for people who work in areas where there's lots of snakes and who need that kind of extra protection because of what they're walking through. Um, well, Dr. Taylor, we are at our time, but we do have a few more questions. Do you mind if we get through these for a couple more minutes? Okay, perfect. Um, Virginia asked, what causes the venom to travel in your body? For example, I had a patient who was bit on the calf, but the main damage of the venom was in his brachial plexus and ended up with a dead arm. That's so weird. So I can answer the first part of the question, which is how it's transferred. It's transferred prim primarily through the lymphatic system. Um, I cannot answer, ask, answer the question about why that affected the brachial plexus, um, except to say that I'm not a physician, so I don't know, but also, Snake bites are odd. There's a lot of um, weird kind of idiopathic things that occur that we just really can't explain. Um, so because it's transferred via the lymphatic system, that kind of helps to explain why the cut and suck or the, or the snake bite kits don't work. I mean, if you really think about it, it's not like when, when, you, when, when a snake bites, it's not like there's just a pool of venom down there. It immediately kind of goes out into the tissue and then slowly gets brought up by the lymphatic system. So there's not a, a source that you can just pull out, you can't pull anything out. Um, 
A tourniquet, which is totally not advised for rattlesnake bites, a tourniquet would compress the blood vessels and also the lymphatic vessels and would keep the venom in the affected limb. The reason that that is not advised for rattlesnake bites is because the primary risk for rattlesnake bites is going to actually be tissue damage to the affected limb. So if you're actually keeping that, ven that venom in the limb, then you're increasing the concentration and the likelihood that can happen. So if you're, you know, and again, I'm not an expert on cobras, but if you're out in um, Asia or Africa, some people say that cobra bites, that tourniquets may be indicated then because in that case is primarily a neurotoxin and keeping it in the affected limb and away from the heart and breathing muscles and so on might be important. So snake bite first aid is very, very, very complicated, which is why it's so important to get help from that national snake bite support network, whereas people who are physicians, which I am not, who can help and veterinarians, which I am not, who can help with those things. Thank you for sharing that. Um, we've had a few questions about Mojave greens, if they are more dangerous or more aggressive than rattlesnakes or other species. Um, and there was some discussion about how they've moved from Kern County into Monterey County. And if you know if there have been any incidences with these in Monterey County or Slow County. Yeah, okay. So I'm gonna start with the last part first, which is um, sometimes I actually put that myth into my presentation. Uh, the myth that um, Mojave rattlesnakes have moved kind of out of their normal range. It is a myth, it is not true. We hear it constantly all the time. I've heard it um, locally here. There's a myth among some of the vineyard workers in the North County of San Luis Obispo County that Mojave rattlesnakes were released by farm workers. I don't know where that got started, but it's a myth, just, uh, just as much of a myth as the baby rattlesnakes being more toxic. The truth is that many of our Southern and Northern Pacific rattlesnakes are greenish in coloration. So people think Mojave green, that's why they say that. In fact, Mojave rattlesnakes aren't even all that green. So it's just, a, it's like almost because someone named them that, that then people said that's Mojave rattlesnake. It's not a Mojave rattlesnake. Mojave rattlesnakes are indeed in part of Kern County. And then they're, they're down in the Southeast part of the state in the desert. And Mojave rattlesnake venoms, just like many species of rattlesnake venoms varies geographically depending on where you are but some populations of Mojave rattlesnakes venoms do have neurotoxins that can be very, very, very dangerous to, they, they can, they can um, their prey items or a person if they're unlucky to be envenomated can stop breathing, their heart can be impacted. So for that reason, that can be a big problem. Some populations of Southern Pacific rattlesnakes have that as well though. So this is not a Mojave rattlesnake versus other rattlesnakes. This is speaking to the complexity of rattlesnake venoms and how much they vary um, a lot, they vary a lot. Thank you. Um, Brandon wants to know, is it true that you can age a rattlesnake by its rattles? That was another myth that I thought about including and I just wanted to make sure that I had time for questions. So I cut some of them out. Um, this is a perfect example of one that there's like a grain of truth to it, but not completely. So the answer is no, that you can't, but you might be able to get an idea about how, kind of how old it is. So first of all, a rattlesnake adds a new segment to its rattle every time it sheds. And so the myth arose because people said, well, it sheds once a year. Well, rattlesnakes don't shed once a year. They shed depending on how much food they eat and how much they grow. Baby rattlesnakes can shed, oftentimes can shed much more than once per year. And sometimes adult rattlesnakes that aren't eating as much may take may shed only once every two years. Sometimes they might shed three times in a year, who knows, right? And so um, that's, that's one reason why you can't tell. But the other reason why is that most adult rattlesnakes, the end of their rattle breaks off. It's made of the same material as your fingernails. Do any of us have our fingernails we were born with? Heck no, it would be really long. They would have broken off. Same thing with a rattlesnake's rattle. But the, the part that you can use is every time a rattlesnake makes a new, every time it sheds, it makes a new rattle at the base of the tail. So closest to the tail. And the width of that rattle, not the length, but the width of that, of that segment is the same width as the rattlesnake's tail. So if you see a rattlesnake rattle that tapers like this, then it means that that little rattle at the end was made just a few years ago and that snake's tail was tiny back then. So you'd know that's a young rattlesnake. Whereas if you see a rattlesnake whose rattle is parallel going way out, then that rattlesnake has been that big for many years. And I should point out that rattlesnakes can live 60 years or more if they don't get eaten by a hawk or something. So they live for a long time. Wow, that is really interesting. Um... We had another question about um, how a rattlesnake would express pain if it was in pain. 
what that looks like? Oh, that's such a good question. Um, in general, I would say that Scientists' understanding of pain in other animals is very difficult because we can't communicate with them. Um, it's 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 a really it's actually a really complex kind of ethical question when you're talking about things like research on animals is being able to understand um, what's painful, what's not, what's you know what what we can and should do to animals. Um, so what I can tell you is that a rattlesnake that's in severe pain, like a snake that has been run over by a car but isn't dead, will oftentimes um, exhibit this writhing behavior. They'll be right, they'll writhe around and they're kind of coiling and they're uncoordinated. Um, that's the only thing that I can really tell you for sure that I've noticed that a rattlesnake in pain would do. When we, we do things sometimes during our research that might um, inflict like a tiny amount of pain, like when we draw blood, a blood sample, we use a syringe on their tail and they'll definitely flinch when they do, do that, just like any other animal would do. But then just like you are, you know, you're getting the blood drawn. It's just the first part that hurts. So they move on from that. They can't blink their eyes. They can't move their face. They can't do anything to communicate um, to us otherwise that they would be in pain. Great to know. Um, uh, and another question was, do rattlesnakes have a recovery time after biting something? Like, can they still bite something else after they've released a lot of venom? Yeah, so when a rouse, so first of all, there's no rules because these rules are meant to be broken. Weird things happen, but in general, the general pattern is that when a rattlesnake bites a prey item, it injects part, but not all of its venom. So usually it takes maybe two, three, three or four, I think would be successive bites to completely exhaust its venom supply. And then it takes about two weeks until it's fully restored but that hasn't been studied that well. And furthermore, that means it starts restoring it right away. So it probably has a little bit to begin with for a while. So there's no amount of time when it's like a rattlesnake has bitten a bunch and then you can pick it up and handle it and be safe. That's not a thing. Um, rattlesnakes can be, you, you wanna think of them as always having venom available, but they definitely can, like if they bite multiple times, then they can run out of venom for a short period of time. Um, somebody else asked, um, we've seen rattlers swim. Do they swim by choice or is that a result of falling in or having to need to swim? They're good swimmers. They'll swim right across, they'll swim right across pools, um, lakes. They, they're, they're good swimmers and they're doing it on purpose. They know exactly where they're going. Good to know. Um, they can climb too. They can climb up trees too. Uh, Southern Pacific rattlesnakes don't do it as often as some of the ones in the forests out east. But we regularly, when it's really hot out, we'll see them like a couple feet up in a bush, maybe getting a little, little bit cool breeze, maybe. Uh, someone asked, since rattlesnakes feel vibrations in their jaws, would they tend to avoid an area that has a lot of ground vibration? That's the idea. Um, I'm actually not sure. I'm not sure if anyone's ever studied that. I may have missed a study on that. Um, I think so. It seems like if there's a lot of construction, if there's a lot of, you know, a lot of noise going on, the snakes tend to move out of those areas. But again, tend to, right? There's exceptions to everything. You can find rattlesnakes like this past summer in Slow. I was shocked to find snakes in people's yards that were many houses away from the open area, just going right into where the traffic was. And uh, why, were, why were they doing that? I don't know. Um, so maybe they're looking for water. I'm not sure. But um, so yes, I think so, but I don't know any data to support that. Um, Kathy asked if you, do you know if you, if you receive an antivenom, can you receive it again? And if you're bitten a second time, is it worse the second time? Um, I, I'm not 100% sure on this because I'm not a physician. Um, there is some evidence that the that people can develop an allergy to both to rattlesnake venom to begin with, but um, also to anti venom. And I believe, although I would encourage someone to please check with a medical professional because this is not my area of expertise, that for people who've been envenomated multiple times and been treated with crofab, which is the main um, anti venom 
that the but now there's a new one on the on the market called Anavipe, which is like literally you would use it for someone who's already had Crofab. But I'm not sure about the indications because I'm not a doctor. So um, yes, I know it can happen. It can be a problem. Um, as far as the second bite, um, was the question if the second bite could be worse? Is that the question? Yeah. Um, so much of what determines a snake a snake bite's severity score is going to depend on things like how much venom was injected. But I will say that um, some people can develop a sensitivity to rattlesnake venoms and can go into anaphylactic shock and have a very bad bite the second time around because of their sensitivity from the first time. So in that sense, yes, it can be. But I would say that in general, most of what contributes to the bite is all the other factors I've mentioned before. So it's hard to predict that for sure. And um, I think this will be our last question of the night, but Leslie asked, uh, what makes the rattle sound? Yeah, so the rattle, um, the rattlesnake's rattle is basically a series of interlock interlocking pieces of this keratin, which is like your fingernail. So the rattlesnake's end of its tail has this weird little kind of like hook thing on it. And then the rattles are all attached to one another precariously. So when the tail shaker muscle actually shakes and it, the rattlesnake tail shaker muscle can contract, it has one of the top speeds in the animal kingdom, it contracts really fast. What you get is you get these interlocking pieces of keratin just zzz against each other. And, um, and that's how they make that warning noise, which is saying, get away from me. I don't want to bite you. So informative. Thank you so much, Dr. Taylor. I learned a ton and I'm super excited to share this information with everybody. Um, I feel like you should write a, a myth busting rattlesnakes book at this point. I learned actually so there was um there's a book that was just published by my colleague David Steen that's called Secrets of Snakes, and it's a myth busting book on snakes in general. So wow. it has a bunch of my information and more, and it's really well written. So anyone who's interested in snakes should get that book, Secret of Sn Secrets of Snakes, which is written by David Steen. Awesome. I'm super interested to learn more about all the snakes that are in the Los Padres, but um, can't thank you enough for being here, for helping us better understand these beautiful creatures. Um, and again, um, if you haven't done so and you'd like to learn more about these snakes, I'm going to put um, Central Coast Snake Services in the chat. Um, so everybody can learn more about that. And um, you can find Dr. Taylor's um, contact information from there. So thank you so much, everybody, for joining us. And I hope you all have a great rest of your night. Thanks again for being here. Thank you. Bye, everyone.